the anniversary, the big anniversary, 50 years of Doctor Who is what, next year, right? <laughs> So, how many people in this room kind of got started with Doctor Who with, with Chris Eccleston and then decided to go back in time? Yeah? And how many of those people look at those young whippersnappers and say, look, I had Tom Baker's scarf before Tom Baker was cool, right? Well, of course, after Tom, uh, we, we, we have the fifth Doctor. And when I was a kid, man, I, I, I think I wore out a VCR tape of the special called The Five Doctors. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's on Netflix now, right? I think that you can stream that these days. Totally worth watching if, if you're looking for a primer on, on the original Doctors. But uh, in, in more recent years, uh, I've enjoyed his work. Actually, Peter Davison does a tremendous job on Law & Order UK. And if you haven't seen it before, What's great is that there's nothing to not like about his character. Right? He's just a, a, a good guy doing a good job. But that, you know what? He'll make, maybe tell us more about that. But the reason he's here is to celebrate this thing that is Doctor Who with you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Peter Davis. They should queue up politely. It's been a British style queue. Yes, yeah. we're very good at queuing the British. Right. Drive the lorry, watch the telly, get in the queue, uh, and, and uh, we can ask a question in, in just a little bit. But uh, uh, first off, I, I should ask you how many of, of these sorts of cons have you done now? Of these sorts of cons, not that many. I've done a lot of just very, just only who based cons, mm -hmm. really. But uh, apart from. Uh, this and I think I did, I did Dragon Con in Atlanta, which was extraordinary. Uh, um, uh, and uh, this is the only one I've done in New York, which is fantastic. Really? It's your first time here? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, what was your first at, uh, Who conference? I mean, was uh, it during the, the run of the show? Or? Uh, it was actually before I appeared as the doctor. I did it in really? Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, <laughs> At the Hotel Camelot. Uh, and it did actually have a moat around this uh, uh, hotel, which is a sort of parking lot. Um, that's why I was famous, famously, it was shortly after, I think, uh, um, I think not long before, I think John Lennon had, had been shot up. Mm. And it was something terrible like that. And, uh, or at least, I don't know, I'm not sure if it was John Lennon, but there was some could he had been shot at. Um, uh, uh, somebody got up and asked me the question, what, uh, do I ever worry that I'm going to be assassinated? Uh, I, I thought that's really a good way to cheer me up. Um, Somebody out there just said, damn, they took my question. <laughs> Assassination, all right. Well, so I, I, I'd like to talk about fan reaction between uh, then and now. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, maybe specifically the, the, the rising of, of the internet um, that, that we've seen since the 90s now through today. Um, how Whovians can, can get together and, and discuss a little more frequently. You know, it used to be that cons were a way that people could gather in order to know that they weren't, you know, alone or, or yeah. that they could share some stories and all of that. And that still happens, that's why we're here, right? But, um, but, but that said, those communities now are, are almost, um, I'll see you at the con because we've been chatting at each other. Oh, I'll see you, right? I'll see you in real life. Yeah, I'll see you in real life. And so now that's a different sort of fourth wall that we're breaking down. And I, I wonder how much reading you might do about this thing that you were a part of. How much reading? Yeah, how much reading online? I mean, do you, oh, in well, the worlds of, say, fan fiction or uh, these other things? <laughs> I do. I get given when I come to a, a, a Who convention. I quite often get given uh, uh, books uh, uh, that sort of people have written, you know, stories that people have written, um, and uh, I always take them away with me. And I think, well, I'll, I'll read them on the plane on the way back. And so I got given one at a recent convention, which turned out to be a kind of uh, 
Fifty Shades of Grey take on that. <laughs> Fascinating it was. Um, <laughs> I'll find the name and I'll read the name out to you, but uh, I don't have it with me now. Um, no, but uh, um, I, I don't go, I don't sort of scan the, the internet to discover things about uh, Doctor Who. Sometimes it, it's, it's, it's best not to, you're afraid of what you might hear. Um, <laughs> um, but it's, no, I, I, I love, I've always loved the, uh, the, the, the fandom of uh, uh, whether it's of Doctor Who or, or whatever, it, whatever it is, uh, uh, because it just seems. You do seem to be an extraordinarily tolerant bunch of people, and I mean this in the nicest way because it's every kind of facet of human, the human condition, which you see at any kind of convention. Mm -hmm. But a complete acceptance by everyone who's there mm -hmm. of whatever it is that's go that's going on, uh, and uh, uh, you, re you seldom see, in, in, as you say, real life. Um, so I love it. I love it. I love being here. Well, well, forgive me for asking the question that, that I'm, I'm sure you've been asked before, but, but when you first approached the role as the Doctor, uh, as an actor, was there any love of, of science fiction in your life? Or, or was, was this just another role and a new adventure for you? Well, I, I, I did love science fiction, but I'm talking about some sort of H.G. Wells and John Wyndham and people mm -hmm. like that. And um, uh, that's really the only kind of science fiction that I'd, I'd actually read. But I'd always watched Doctor Who. I'm the, I'm the, the first actor who uh, grew up with Doctor Who. I, mean, I think I was uh, 12 when it started. And so I watched it all the way through. And, and even when I became an actor, I remember thinking, it'd be great to get a part in Doctor Who one day. <laughs> Never suspecting at all that I'd actually be playing the Doctor. Uh, so it was a great thrill. And, and indeed, it, it was quite a challenge to come to terms with the fact that I would actually be playing a, a sort of an icon from my childhood, uh, and it, it, which is why actually I didn't accept the pop job straight away. It just seemed such an extraordinary idea that I should be playing it. But yeah, no, I was. I did love science fiction uh, and all the, the various. Uh, of course, you know, you had to deal with uh, um, pretty shabby special effects in the old days. Of course, I thought they were uh, say it, uh, Of course, pre Doctor Who, I'm talking about. But in the early days when I was growing up, some of the uh, you know. Uh, um, effects on, uh, um, especially B movie science fiction, is fairly amusing. Um, <laughs> my kids now are brutal about special effects as well. Even, even things that are like four years old, they look at and go, well, "That's not very good, is it?" <laughs> that cost them millions four years ago. No, it just doesn't come to scratch. <laughs> I'm convinced by virtually everything, even Doctor Who. <laughs> You mean your kid kids, not your famous son-in-law, right? Yeah, I okay. <laughs> He is one of my kids, you're absolutely right, yes. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about, yes? <laughs> it was cool to see you two together. Um, yeah. I mean, well, no, I mean, it was, it's what was, was doing that episode with, with David, like, I don't know, trying on an old suit? Well, it, no, it was quite a, it was quite a weird experience for really. me. I mean, it was first put to me by I know S Stephen Moffat quite well, and he, we, I remember we were sitting in the garden of at my house, and uh, he said to me, you know, how would you feel about taking part in uh, in, in, a, in a special Doctor Who special that children need? And I looked at him and said, well, do you, why do you even have to ask if I'd be okay? But, uh, um, so yeah, I said, yeah, that sounds great. So he wrote this, I thought, very very good. A little short script about um, both about uh, uh, um, the tenth Doctor looking back, uh, being the fifth Doctor, but of also, of course, because I was, believe it or not, David Tennant's Doctor, and also about David remembering looking at me on the TV, and it, it worked brilliantly well, and we had enormous fun doing it. We did it in one day. We, we did it in one day. I was doing a show. Yeah, I was doing it in a show. In, I was in a show in town, Spamalot. Uh, <laughs> Which I had a beard on, and uh, it was in, as I say, London. And so uh, uh, on Saturday night, uh, I rushed off stage, shaved off the beard, uh, got in a car, and was driven down to Cardiff, where they filmed Doctor Who. Mm -hmm. And then woke up in the morning, uh, and we went to the studio and we, we did it. And um, both of us, because I think we were so excited to be doing it, spoke so quickly that we took, a, I think, what was meant to be a 12 minute script, and it lasted about eight. <laughs> because. <laughs> The director, uh, who said it was so grown up, and said, oh, it's nice, it's okay, it's okay. But uh, it was fantastic to do.
Loved it. Loved it. That's excellent. That's excellent. He wasn't my son-in-law at the time, of course. No. Uh, um, that comes later. I'd suggested. I thought I've got this very nice daughter. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. <laughs> well, uh, I've always wanted to go to Cardiff, but I think it's just to look for the Torchwood Building just to see if I can. Okay. Uh, so, three seasons, right? Three full seasons? Yeah, yeah three seasons. Doctor. Yeah. And your decision to leave was kind of predetermined by you, right? I... Well, what happened was that I, um, I worked with Patrick Troughton in an episode in, uh, of All Creatures Great and Small. And um, I... I... <laughs> he, he played a tramp. In that. But anyway, uh, but, but the, the, the joke was, and this is absolutely true, it sounds bizarre, but I, um, he, I drove into Television Centre where we recorded Doctor Who and he, he, he was just being turned out, turned away from the car park. In the old days, you could always get into the car park, but then they brought in new security people around about the beginning of the 80, 1980s, and they were far stricter about who they let into the BBC car park. And um, uh, uh, Patrick Trout had just been turned away. You always tried to get to the car park because it was much easier than having to park half a mile away but they just said oh sorry no you're not not important enough and, and uh, then, uh, then I came up behind and said I'm Peter Davis and I, I played the doctor and like, yeah of course come in uh, so I got in and, and he didn't uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, he took it very well really but he said I said oh, you know I'm, I'm doing this doctor here what do you think uh, and he said just do three years and get out um, and I sort of thought well that's quite a good you know thing to do really that's what he'd done uh, William Hartman had done three years, uh, Tom Baker of course had done many more, but you know I was still quite young and I did feel that there were many other things I wanted to do, so I knew I wasn't going to want to do it forever, and three years seemed about the right amount of time, uh, and uh, in the end I stuck to that and decided to leave after three years. Yeah. And uh, did you ever look back and say, Man, that was horrible advice. I should have done ten years, or we had always got comfortable with that. As it turned out, no, no, not really. As it turned out, I mean, I, funnily enough, I did have a moment of panic. I had to make the decision in my second season, which I wasn't really very happy with because of various reasons. There were strikes going on, and we were always behind schedule. <coughs> um, and I had a much happier third season, by which time I'd already decided to leave uh, and told them. So I couldn't really go back and go. Actually, I think maybe. Could you get rid of that Colin Baker bloke? And uh, <laughs> um, but I, I was though in the end I was very glad that I left because um, I, I went up shortly after I left. I went up for a part, uh, which the producer teetered on the brink of not offering me because I'd been Doctor Who, mm. and this is the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, it's such an identifiable part that if you suddenly see uh, someone who was recently a Time Lord flying around in a police box. Uh, it's difficult to imagine him uh, as a pottery maker in Victorian England. Uh, uh, and so uh, uh, he said, I'm not sure we can do this. Uh, but eventually we persuaded him that, you know, that I was the only person that could play the part, which was a total lie, of course. Um, uh, and, and, I, and I did it. And, and then, then I kind of got past the whole Doctor Who thing and I was able to look to the future and do many other things. But it's a risky thing, playing mm -hmm. the Doctor for too long, and I think, uh, so that's why I was very glad that I did it for three years. I, I wonder if that's as true now as it was in the early 80s. It would seem now with the, the wealth of entertainment that we have in, in cable here in the US and, and beyond on, online and so forth, yeah. that, that you may be able to become more of a, uh, a chameleon and not be so locked into roles. Um, I would like to think that would be true, and it maybe yeah. is in, in this country. I don't know. Although, you know, I, I, some people manage to move on after. You know, here the contract is seven years. Mm -hmm. Something. Mm -hmm. if, if you're, I mean, that's the irony. If you're in a successful series, you're probably locked into it for seven years, and then when it finishes, you then have to move on. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I think quite a few actors do still find that very difficult. Maybe. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, in, they're probably financially secure by seven years, and they never have, will have to actually worry about uh, being out of work, but they probably actually quite want to move on to other things. And it may be that it's more difficult because they're so identified with the character or for being on TV. Now, I, I wish that wasn't true. Maybe it isn't quite so much now. Um, 
But it's always that almost that catch twenty two of being in a successful series. Mm -hmm. Is it you, you know the longer you do it, the more identified you are with that part. How in touch were you with the writers of the Who series during your tenure? I, I think of some of the, the great writers of, of sci-fi that came out of Doctor Who, and I mean, I'm an enormous Douglas Adams fan, you know, for example, and, and one of many writing on, on that series. But uh, I, I wonder, as this Titanic figure of the Doctor, if, if writers would come to you and, and try to figure out some of your quirks and foibles and all of that to make it more of a natural part of what they were writing with the Doctor. Um, it was it was less of I mean there were certain uh, uh, writers that wanted to write for Doctor Who, there, but you have to remember Doctor Who, now Doctor Who is is the, one of the BBC's premier prestige programs. It really wasn't in those days. It was very successful and it sold to many countries and made the BBC lots of money, but it was never considered a premier drama series. Mm -hmm. So the the people who wrote for Doctor Who quite often were just people who would write for maybe a detective series one week uh, and then a, a, a Doctor Who the next week or maybe, maybe a hospital drama the week after. They weren't really driven by their love of, of, of science fiction. And, um, uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, you know, my last story in case of Antony was Robert Holmes and he was fantastic and it was such a difference to see, you know, to get a script like that and, and, and of course Graham Harper, you know, was fantastic directing it. But quite often you get sort of directors who were sort of, you know, they weren't, they, they, what they, had, they didn't have a passion for the, the job. Mm -hmm. And that was because I think it wasn't a prestige program. I, I, um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, we had, we had good writers on it, I'm not saying that. But, but I, I think that uh, uh, some of them were just, you know, Right, writers wanted to do one week this, one week that. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas what I feel now is the difference is largely Doctor Who is written by people uh, with a passion mm -hmm. uh, for what they're doing. And, and, and I suppose, you know, in a way, the great comfort to me about that is, uh, um, and the other classic Doctors, is that these people were all sitting out there as kids in the audience watching us do Doctor Who. And they all grew up. And let's face it, if you take a few of the faces that were watching us on TV, you know, one grew up to be the Doctor, one grew up to write a lot of the series, and two of them grew up to be producers of the series. I mean, they're all fantastic fans. Mm -hmm. Stephen Moffat can tell you, just by looking at one single black and white picture of uh, any Doctor Who story from the classic series, and he can tell you not only what episode it is, uh, uh, what story it is, what episode it is, he can tell you how far into the episode that, that, that scene was. Really? I've, seen, I've seen him do it. It's wow. quite extraordinary. He just was just obsessed and devoted to Doctor Who. <laughs> that's, that's, wow. That's it's crazy. disturbing as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I didn't want to say it, but you did. <laughs> yeah, Stephen and Russell are, are, are incredible. I mean, they, they've done a remarkable job. And it, have, have been, in speaking with them, uh, it, is there, I, I don't know, this is being blogged about probably as we speak, but uh, well, what do you guys think? With the 50th anniversary coming up, are we seeing the end of a chapter? Is, do you think it's going to go on hibernation for a little while, or do you think we're going to see this thing push on? Well, I know what you want, but I mean, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> you think it'll change, like, change the hand of a time off, Steve will hand it off to somebody else? Well, <laughs> the viewer <pure revolt. laughs> I can't uh, really. <laughs> um, I can't see any sign of it uh, um, ending. Uh, I, don't, I think yeah. it's going on as a fair old lick at the moment, and I think it'll continue. And I hope it does. Uh, um, you know, I mean, it got to a very low point before it was uh, um, cancelled the last time, uh, and I always knew that when it was cancelled, it would come back. I think I always felt that so it, it would just have a certain amount of time would pass, and then someone would think it was a good idea to bring it back. And mm -hmm. Russell T Davis. Uh, the rumour has it. I've never heard this from his mouth, but the rumour has it that uh, basically the BBC went to him and said, um, we want you to write something for us, anything you want, you know, just write. Uh, uh, and he said, I want to bring back Doctor Who. And so, of course, they did, because he, 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 you know, he was such a success at the time. He could just write his own ticket, and that was what he wanted to do. So you've gotten together with uh, some of the more recent doctors, and uh, I'm wondering if anybody asked you what you were up to next year for the 50th <laughs> anniversary. You know, every day I check the phone to see if Stephen Moffat has called me, but... Uh, I'll check. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. I honestly, I, I'm sure people think, 
think that I, I'm in some way sworn to secrecy, but I don't know what's happening next year. I've no, uh, um, uh, I've nothing to report on, on that. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be something fantastic, uh, but I don't know what. I think Stephen Moffat's playing it very close to his chest. I mean, we could totally make all of the doctors look like they were from their era. <laughs> like, like Tron uprising. Well, hang on, like, you know, like, I could stretch my, head, my face back. <laughs> um, yeah, I think if, if, we're, if we're not invited, I'm going to make my own rival. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You know, I did these little videos. I did a convention in, in California, and I did these. Uh, uh, I couldn't attend the first one. I was invited to one in California, and I couldn't attend. So um, I, I made my own little video about failing to attend, <coughs> uh, and uh, I sent it along, and it was pretty quite successful. So the next year, um, when I was going to attend, I did another one. Have any of you seen these things? <laughs> uh, I put them on Vimeo, by the way, if anyone wants to. Uh, um, <laughs> Because they're quite fun. I thought, well, my, what's my next project going to be after these two videos? I know. I'll do my own 50th anniversary special. <laughs> <laughs> Coin Baker's prepared to work for nothing. Um, <laughs> and your computer graphics will rival those of the early 1980s. <laughs> Yeah, I am working with, it'll be very good because I'm working with about the same standard of classic, uh, 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 classic Doctor Who uh, special effects. Yeah. I'll be there helping. I'll be getting the boom into the shot. The sets will wobble. <laughs> well, it, it's, um, it is a pleasure to have you here. I, I was thinking about your, your three years as the Doctor, and I think we had the introduction of a, a few pretty vital villains. Uh, during your time. Uh, the Daleks weren't exactly new, but um, the Cybermen were new during your... No, the Cybermen have been around for a long time. They have changed. They? Yeah, there was a revamp of the Cybermen. The Maybe the Cybermen look more today like they did back... Well, the Cybermen, when they first started, were b rather bizarre looking creatures. They kind of had... Uh, uh, they were sort of in the silver suits, uh, but then they right. had a big, like a car uh, uh, headline uh, on uh, their heads. Yeah, okay. Uh, and they had sort of cloth faces. Mm -hmm. They spoke in a very strange voice, which would be something like, uh, We have come here to destroy you. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, they, they, gra they gradually changed in my time to a more kind of uh, dark sort of... Uh, um, it's more Cyberman voice, actually, that they use now. Um, and I pref much preferred that. Uh, uh, although I'm still haunted by that rather jolly... We are here to destroy you. <laughs> um, so, uh, but the, 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 uh, the Daleks, funny enough, hadn't been around for some time because there was some kind of dispute about who owned the rights to the, the, Dalek, the Daleks. Uh, and, and it was touch and go whether they were going to appear in my time. But finally, I think uh, the BBC reached agreement with Terry Nation we were able to do one. Mm -hmm. We made up for it, though, because we killed a heck of a lot of Daleks <laughs> in, in my story, Resurrection of the Daleks. I think it had, the, I think it had a higher body count uh, than Terminator or something. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, a, lot, a lot of parents were appalled. The kids loved it. <laughs> but my favourite scene, my, my kids, my, my own children's favourite scene, even now in Doctor Who, is me pushing a Dalek out of a window. <laughs> and, uh, they loved it. That's fantastic. Well, uh, we're, we're sort of arriving at that time where if you are thinking about a question uh, for, for Peter, you could uh, queue up at the mic. And actually, while we do that, do come here. Come here. Come here. <laughs> I have one. I, I saw you a while ago, and I was pretty sure that Peter wasn't going to dress up as the fifth doctor. Uh, so come around. Costume check for for those listening on Sirius XM. Uh, we have uh, a young man dressed as the Fifth Doctor, and Natalie dressed, shall I say? I think he did fine work. Yes. I, I think, uh, let's see, uh, Peter, can can we go ahead and grade this? Uh, oh, and a sonic screwdriver to boot. I, I, I didn't really have a sonic screwdriver like this, but uh, this is a rather modern sonic screwdriver. I, I blew mine up, I think, in my second story. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. And what's your name, buddy? Stuart. Stuart. Good to see you. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining us, Doctor. And, and Doctor, you, you may retake your seat. That's brilliant. Excellent. I love the attention to detail that comes in like this.
I mean, I love the attention to detail in kind of I think that's extraordinary. Yeah. I talked with a guy yesterday who was dressed up as the, 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 the uh, prototypical hero of a video game that's not even out yet. <laughs> it's coming out in a couple minutes. And he's gotten the screenshots and decided to just you know, really? blow up the show. Yeah, it, it's pretty cool. Well, uh, and now when you come up to the mic, uh, please say, say who you are and, and where you're from. Please. Kevin Earth. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a valid answer. Thank you. For the time being. Uh, yes, a couple very quick questions. I've been listening to, re listening to a bunch of your uh, Big Finish audios uh, recently. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, what characters besides the Doctor, maybe Tristan Farnan or Albert Campion or um, uh, your character from Rigor Mortis, uh, would you like to be able to bring back in any medium? Oh, uh, uh, um, you mean on, on an audio thing? Um, I, I enjoyed, I did a series years ago called Very Peculiar Practice, which was great when I played a university doctor. Uh, I did a, which is funny, uh, two people have seen that. Uh, <laughs> I did a series called The Last Detective, which funny enough, I, I, yeah. I went into a Barnes and Noble the other day, and they had all the series of Last Detective. I didn't even know it had gone out over here. Um, but, uh, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know apart from that. It just, it's fun doing those. I love doing the audio books. Of course, you can pretend you still look like you did. Um, That's what I was thinking. That's still sort of the idea. It's I mean, a great relief. Yeah, these yeah. great stories of the doctor and your other What they do every time we do these audio books is they take pictures of us, of the cast that are in, um, of the audio books that are put on the CDs. So, you, you don't want to take pictures of me. <laughs> because I want people to think, oh, you know, I still look like... Sure. Yeah. They'll take pictures of everybody else. Yeah, do a cartoon. Hey, how's it going? And the second question is, you talk about how you've done hundreds of these conventions. Do you ever talk to the actors from the new series and give them, basically, warnings about... Warnings? <laughs> you yes. wanted him to warn his, like, yeah. new son-in-law off? <laughs> yeah, exactly, yes. David, don't ever do these things. <laughs> Um, no, I don't. I don't warn them off. No, I, although I, you know, you give them sort of a friendly advice about you know uh, protective measures to take. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. No, no. <laughs> yeah, we're working on a family convention. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sammy, um, and I'm from New York. But uh, the, I'm sure you've had this question before. I've just never heard a reply from it or anything. But going back to your first episode on Doctor Who, like, how did you feel about tearing up the scarf? <laughs> uh, I loved uh, every moment. <laughs> Do you know what? This is a very interesting thing. I, I think I, I came up with the idea of this uh, unraveling the scarf in order to find my way back to where we'd started. That's but kind of when, we, when we did it, because they, of course they had about four scarves, so you think I unraveled the scarf? No, I didn't. I unraveled about four of the scarves. All four, because what Bobby discovered was none of them, uh, uh, they were all done with bits of wool, no longer than about sort of three meters. Every time we started to unravel it, we just come to a stop. <laughs> so we had to rethink it. We had, then had to tie them all together and do, do loops of wool underneath. So it looked like I was unraveling, but actually I was pulling out more wool from underneath the scarf. Um, I think we did that. We, I think we had one left. But we unraveled quite a lot of them. I think they're pretty shoddy pieces of work, actually. <laughs> I thought I thought these were done, you know, would have been expert and knitted scarves, but uh, look, I, I, we're as all Tom Baker had been yeah, teaching me or something. I don't know. We're all justifiably jealous of Tom Baker's hair, but those scarves have nothing to you. That's just wrong. Hey. Hi, I'm Bill Revers. I'm from six blocks south of here, <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, um, the DVD commentaries that you participated in with your TARDIS gang yeah. are, are very well regarded among people who buy all of the DVDs, especially because it was such a tightly knit crew, most of whom, including yourself, left very suddenly and very dramatically and emotionally. Right. And people love hearing these commentaries of everyone reminiscing and having a really great time. And I just wanted to maybe get some more details about that experience doing those commentaries and if you hang out and get drinks afterwards and sort of how fun it is to see people. If we're drunk to begin with. Well, <laughs> uh, I, I wanted to, I didn't want to ask that, but I think you would probably address that question. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I liked them to be set up as if 
we just happened to be sitting around in my front room and put an old DVD on the telly and just would be talking about it. Um, uh, um, and of course, you know, I love them doing them when Janet's there because you really have to try and keep a lid on her and that's part of the excitement of it. Um, and it sounds, I'm very aware that sometimes it sounds like we're just slacking off the program, but we're doing it from a kind of affectionate uh, point of view. But it, we did, it does come over a bit sometimes, like, there was, I mean, at one point I remember we were going along, I thought very nicely, and then the, the, uh, the director of the comedy stopped the thing and said, uh, Janet, uh, do you think you could find something nice to say about the program? <laughs> um, but we don't think of it when we're doing it like that, because we, you know, we know what we're like, we know what the shortcomings were. It's just a kind of affectionate, if you like, an affectionate slagging off of the program. Um, but um, I'm also aware that it's far more difficult when the director's there. <laughs> it's, and I think you'll find that the ones where there's a director present aren't quite as good as the ones when there isn't a director present. Uh, because, you know, you can't really go, well, that's a terrible shot. <laughs> because they might get slightly offended. Um, but I, I just wanted it to seem like we just have to be sitting around. Because we, we're not drunk and we don't get a drink afterwards. We just get kind of a bit high on the whole kind of atmosphere of doing it. And it, we enjoy them immensely. So do we... I said, sorry, but so I just as a... I said, you know, because quite often they will stop us because of bad language. <laughs> That's bullshit. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I said... While we're all still alive and we're around, why don't we just do uh, an, a, a sort of un unedited, yeah, sort of, uh, uh, just so you, you know, maybe, maybe 10, 15 years before you'll ever release it, you know, until, until people become a little more tolerant about it. <laughs> <laughs> Distasteful language. But anyway, but, and the idea is that you're just kind of in a liberated way, just talking about what you're seeing, and, and uh, rather than stop and say, don't say that, don't say that, or can't use that word there. Just let us record it, and let's have it for posterity, uh, um, you know, in your archives, or at least with a parental warning. <laughs> do, you know, do you know if they ever considered doing uh, one of those in character, as if the TARDIS crew was actually watching their own past adventures? I've never heard of that. That would require an awful lot of effort. <laughs> <laughs> or <laughs> indeed talent, <laughs> that I'm not sure we possess, but... <laughs> we'll imagine. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm Mary from Poughkeepsie, New York. Hi. Um, I just wanted to tell you I loved watching you on the BBC America specials that just recently aired. And uh, I realize you're probably more biased towards your own and David's stories, but I, want, I wanted to know what your favorite Doctor Who surprise was. My, my greatest Doctor Who surprise was? Like something you didn't expect in the plot line. As I'm watching the stories? Yes. Um, Hmm, that's a difficult one. I don't know really. Well, Christmas never turns out well. No. <laughs> no, but you kind of know Christmas is not good. I've never gone to London on Christmas. <laughs> Doesn't it? I mean, uh, um, I thought the. I, I, I've actually said to him, uh, and I'm going to think it's another David Tennant obsessed thing, but I did, I did suggest to him that one of the most brilliant things that they could have done, and I thought they did very well, was turning up, uh, of having a second David, a certain second, a tenth doctor, who was still on Earth, getting older. Because that means that at any point in the future, he can come back yeah. as that character that is getting older, which is more than the rest of us can do. So, uh, yeah. Don't you think if they do a multi-doctor episode next year for the anniversary, don't you think that would be like the best thing to do? Yeah. Because, you know, David, David, you know, he's lovely, he's handsome, but he has aged, and that would explain some things, you know? Yeah. And I want commission. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. I'm the master and I'm from Gallifrey. You are? <laughs> You're a bad lot. <laughs> I'm not afraid of him. <laughs> so you say now. Hmm? So you say now. <laughs> uh, in Planet of Fire, it was very strongly alluded that there may be some sort of familiar relationship between the Doctor and the Master. There was one? What? what? Uh, one episode we watched the Master burn to death. His last comment was, you do this to your own, and then they cut him off. It oh. implied there might be a family related. relationship between the Doctor and the Well, Master. yes, you know, I think they, they leave these sort of little loose ends lying around uh, sometimes. Uh, so it gives them the possibility of, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of just exploring them at a later date, or not. Or dropping them, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've been, 
I've been waiting uh, a long time for the story that involved Queen Elizabeth I. You know, from the, uh, um, from the story a few seasons back, where Which she, knows, she obviously knows the Doctor. Right. I, I want to know what that story was. <laughs> so I think sometimes they just drop these little loose ends in, thinking, that would be a good thing to pick up at a later date, and then maybe they do, maybe they don't. So, so how would you feel about the two words being related? I think it's a good idea. I think it'd be quite interesting, yes. Yeah, so the one is the sort of black sheep of the family. That, that would Quite be literally. Yeah. <laughs> cool, thank you. Uh, as a follow-up question, um, Sylvester McCoy was recently quoted as saying it might be nice if the older doctors could come back and play villains. If they were to do that, who would you like to play? You. <laughs> uh, good luck. Peter, my name is Robert, I'm from upstate New York, oh, yeah. and uh, on, on another comment on your commentaries, one thing I particularly like from your commentaries are your speculations on how your episodes may have been different were they filmed today. And of course one of the big differences between today's era and yours is romance in the TARDIS. And I'm curious, uh, in your opinion, which of your three female companions would you, <laughs> would you have preferred to uh, take in a fancy to during your tenure as the Doctor? Can we turn down the lights? For I, think, <laughs> I think they all had their uh, own different sort of um, <laughs> attractive features, if you like. Um, uh, but Turlo! <laughs> well, at least you haven't said uh, 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 Adric. <laughs> Maybe all three, who knows? <laughs> I don't be completely liberated about this. Um, <laughs> That's what you read about on the plane. <laughs> you know, you're nearly, you're nearly absolutely spot on. Canine is very political I think, you know, I think uh, uh, Tegan may be a, a good possibility, but I think he just find it too, irri he find that too ir irritating <laughs> in the end. You know, I mean. Uh, Sarah, I always thought Sarah was, uh, I thought, uh, uh, Sarah, yes, I would have been, uh, um, actually, probably, if he choice, but maybe that's too easy a choice, you know? Perry. Um, hmm? Perry. Nicola Bryant. Yeah. <laughs> so I think she, she, st she, stole, she stole my regeneration scene, I don't think I don't know how around that much. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Hi, my name is Shah from Brooklyn, New York. Um, I'd like to know what the suit that the um, how you you wore at Doctor Who, whose idea was it to wear celery? Um, it was the producer's idea to wear celery. Um, he said, I want to have something just slightly unusual for you to wear on your lapel. I said, Oh, great. Well, think of something. And he came to me a few days later and said, I've got a great idea. Stick of celery. <laughs> and I said, Why? <laughs> I don't really have a reason. Just that. So I said, well, as long as you can explain it, um, then that's fine. Uh, so we, we proceeded on that basis. And then it wasn't until we got, to, we were just about to start filming Caves of Androzani. And I suddenly remembered that he had never been explained, although he promised, uh, for three years. And so I reminded him of this. And there were some quick script adjustments to that story. And if you look very, uh, I think listen very closely, it's explained that the celery is an antidote to, I forget the name of the gas now, that the, the doctor is allergic to. Mm -hmm. And therefore he just takes a bite of celery and he's okay again. <laughs> Crumbles under the weight of uh, 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 his new companion, but nevertheless he's, he's okay. Um, uh, yeah, so that's what he was really. It was an antidote, but it was, I have to admit, slightly put in at the last minute. I bet you wouldn't have thought that. Spectrox. Hey, Spectrox, thank you very much. Well done. Yes. I'm Kim, and I have a friend that says I'm from Gallifrey, so um, When I was a kid reading All Creatures Great and Small, I used to imagine, oh, someday I'm going to have my arm up a, a cow's vagina. <laughs> I don't remember if you ever did that on All Creatures Great and Small. But my question is, what's the most fun you had doing all creatures great? What is my most fun? You're saying you don't think the most fun would be having my arm up a cow? No, I, I, don't, I don't remember if you did that or not. Um, I, uh, um, yes, I think that if you watch Doctor Creatures Great and Small, it's 
very hard to have special effects that good. You know, I have definitely on several occasions got my arm up a cow. You know, it, it seemed to me, I couldn't quite believe it. I remember reading the script and thinking, well, this is completely impossible. We can't do this. And then when we went up there, we had a vet advisor, and he would we went around, we followed him around on his visit, and it seemed to, visit, it seemed to me that no matter what was wrong with the cow, almost the first thing that the vet did was put his arm up. <laughs> the poor thing. Uh, I say poor thing, although the cow seemed to me to be quite enjoying it. <laughs> look, look over her shoulder. Mm. Uh, but that's, that's really what the vets do to, to, to really diagnose virtually anything. You know, and in those days, of course, in the 30s, they didn't have rubber gloves. They just would soak their arm and they go... And it is absolutely true that on some occasions, because uh, we were filming in the north and sometimes in the, in the winter, that sometimes the warmest, the only warm part of my entire body was my arm. <laughs> um, the most fun I've ever had in our old creatures great and small. I think we're chasing a sow, ch being chased by a sow. Uh, we, we had this scene where um, I think I had to go and do something with the piglets. And then the idea was that this sow would chase me around the, uh, the, sort, of, the, the sort of pen. And I thought, again, they'd do that by some sort of special effects, but not a bit of it, though. No. They said, just said, get in there and be chased around by a sow. And it was enormous fun because you were just simply playing sort of dodgers with a, a, a great big sow. I, know, I didn't realize at the time quite how dangerous it was uh, until the vet turned up and said, get him out of there. Uh, but that was, that was enormous fun, yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, you can see the basic level of our fun. Thank you. <laughs> can I ask you a quick question before the next one about your current role on Law & Order UK? Um, you, you seem to, to be, like I said uh, when we brought you on, uh, sort of a, just a good guy. A good yeah. character doing a good job, wanting everybody to, to knuckle down and, and do that. And of course there's another Doctor Who connection there with, uh, with Freeman, Freeman on, yeah. on the cast. Um, it, tell, tell me about the that role of, of coming in and doing a, a sort of a, a cop procedural drama. Mm. I, I, I do like the series actually. I, I do, I'm a great fan of the procedural sort of uh, 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 detective series or, or TV series, whether it's, whether it's detectives or whether it's courtroom. Uh, I don't, I, I'm a bit tired now of sort of exploring inter interpersonal relationships in, in shows. I just mm -hmm. think it's quite nice just to have a show that's not about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, all in order UK is just simply about the cases. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they've had to be changed quite a lot. And of course, originally they were based on the US scripts. Right. Right. Uh, but they, they've had been changed an awful lot because you know, the UK justice system is so very different. But the idea really is that that, that job, the, the uh, head of the Crown Prosecution Service, is really just two actors as a kind of just a, a, a almost a, you know, he, he sort of tries to keep fair balances between uh, the enthusiasm of his sort of young buck like uh, 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 prosecutors and, and sort of justice. And he has to make very dis difficult decisions. And my thought about the character was simply. That was what he did at work. He mm -hmm. was just an ordinary guy. He was just mm -hmm. very good at his job. But literally, you, got, you, you, you know, you don't get, he doesn't get passionately involved in it. And sometimes his, you know, his uh, famous character does. He simply has to take a clear eye. Sometimes they get it wrong. You know, they get a lot sure. of flack and press uh, for it. But um, I'd, I, I'd always thought he didn't take his, his work home with him. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you get too sort of stressed out by it. But I like, I like the series a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Greg from Syosset on Long Island. Um, first of all, I want to say it's an honor to meet you, Mr. Davidson. Um, my question is, um, from the very beginning where the first companion was the uh, doctor's granddaughter up until now where we just had the pawns, um, in your opinion, for the doctor, uh, who do you think is the, was the most important companion or the companion that you feel like changed him the most of the entire series? Uh, Rose. I think. Because I think she... I think I, I think what they did there for the first time was they found their feet about how to write for a companion. And I don't think they'd really ever done that. Uh, and of course the secret was, you know, there's some, there's some uh, uh, opinion which says that, you know, that Rose was the most important character in, in those early Doctor Who stories. It was more important in a way than the Doctor was. It was the world seen, of the Doctor seen through Rose's eyes. And I think it was, it was the kind of, she marked the coming of the age of the companion. And uh, uh, I think then they've sort of gone from strength to strength. I think in my time, they made fundamental mistakes. They, they thought that they could make companions interesting by just making them either 
you know, in my case, wanting to kill me, <laughs> or, or, or not wanting to be there, as in Tegan's case. And just sort of wrong, rather than just write a really good, interesting character, uh, and not just give them sort of, sort of a, a mission. And I think that, I just thought it was a brilliant uh, uh, piece of uh, writing. Thank you. Yes. Hey, hi Peter. My name is Eric. I'm from Brooklyn. And I just wanted to tell you you're the only doctor that I've ever seen broadcast original transmission from the series. I saw Planet of Fire Part 1 and 2 in Canterbury in uh, 1984. It was telecast. So I just want to let you know that oh, okay. it holds a lot to my heart. <laughs> because that was a big deal for me because yeah. we only had it in PBS back then. Right. Uh -huh. uh, my question is this. Um, given that you, in the days of Doctor Who, the type of acting and rehearsals was completely different in the way they do things today. I wanted to get your take on that. What was your preferred way of doing it? Back then you had all of the, in the whole week to rehearse with all the actors, and then you came on stage and you had like this like crazy day of shooting all these shots, not enough time to get the shots, and then eventually um, at 10 o'clock they shut down because the, the union said no more. And now today they have at best a read through the cast, and then they spend a long time filming on location, things like that. But you don't get that same sort of intimacy with the castmates. But yeah. there's sort of a trade-off. Which way did you prefer, and why? Um, you know, it, it's 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 horses for courses, really. I think that in the case of our time as Doctor Who, because I think the scripts very often were a bit dodgy when we first got them. It would have been disastrous to go straight into a filming situation without time to iron things out. So I think in my time then, those, those, those weeks, uh, week and a half rehearsal was invaluable. To just sort things out that weren't quite right. I think that one of the great fortunes of the series now uh, uh, is that the scripts are pretty much as tight as they're going to be when they start filming. Ide ideally, I, I'm very happy to go without the rehearsal process uh, 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 and just go straight into the filming. I know it sounds weird, but you, it's something you just got, got used to now. You seldom have now in filming that rehearsal process. And as long as the script is okay, I think that's, that's the best way to do it because you kind of, you're focusing intensely on one scene for <clears throat> half a day, a third of the day it takes you to film it. And that's your, that's your only thing that you're concentrating on. Um, whereas if, the other way, you can iron out, the, you know, you can iron out the sort of the kinks in the script, but then you'll do you in the studio. You're doing it at such breakneck speed, largely you're not doing justice to it. And I think, so I think, uh, oddly, maybe surprisingly, I'd go for the, given the script was good, I'd go for the what the way it's done now. Thank you. Cheers. Well, I'm afraid we have time for just one last question, with Peter. Time is flying. Oh, well, unless you have a TARDIS. <laughs> so we can wind back, back an hour, and we'll do the whole thing again. Yep, sorry. Hi, um, Mike, um, Staten Island, the, the borough of Misfit Toys. And, uh, <laughs> thank you. And, um, All Creatures was a uh, family viewing for my family, Sunday nights in our local PBS station. Um, my, my parents and my sister and I, it was one of those rare shows that the whole family, you know, loved and sat around. Uh, I've often wondered, though, uh, the girl before, just to follow up on the question about the animals, what is the worst thing that ever happened to you uh, with an animal? Or, or if not you, did something ever happen to maybe Christopher Timothy that was horrible and you got to laugh at him? <laughs> <laughs> the worst thing that ever happened to me. Okay, um, there was one particular occasion I remember when um, we were meant to uh, wrestle a, a, a bull calf to the ground. Um, I, I, well, I think I can't remember what we were going to do to it once we dressed it in the ground, but the idea was that we had to catch it. Uh, and the vet said to us, "Look, this is—I don't know if you, you two are going to be able to manage this because it's a really tough job." Uh, uh, but we, we decided we would have a go at it. And then uh, the day before we we, we did it, uh, uh, Chris Timothy strained some part of his anatomy. Uh, and basically couldn't do anything at all. <laughs> so it was left to me to wrestle with the, this, this uh, 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 bull cart to the ground. And it was probably the most scariest thing I've ever, I ever had to do. Actually, I've got a, a weird thing. This is even worse. <laughs> Hang on a minute. Right, so we have... We, no, this is actually far worse. It's a bit graphic, this, so uh, uh, just be aware. 
So we have an artificial insemination scene we've got to do. Now the way this works, I had no idea the way this worked, but apparently what they do is they bring out the poor cow, and they put the cow in this contraption, this big wooden contraption, uh, 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 and so they can't really move, uh, uh, and its back end is exposed, and then they get to bring the bull out, and the bull sees the cow, and the cow, and the bull mounts the, the, the cow to do what, you know, bulls are meant to do. At which point, the vet, this is in real life, at the point at which the bull mounts the cow, puts a test, a sort of like a large test tube in the way, right, so catches uh, what is meant to be inside the cow. <laughs> Uh, now, it was meant to be Robert Hardy and myself, but Robert Hardy, uh, being a distinguished elder actor, said, no way am I doing this. <laughs> so, again, once again, it's left to Muggins here to do it. And I said, well, so I said to the, 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 the vet, Judge, am I really going to do this? And he said, well, he said, you could, you could just pretend to do it, but if you pretend to do it, it might actually be worse than if you try and do it. <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> So, I ended up with having to do this thing with this test tube and go... <laughs> and I, I actually managed to do it, but it was, I just thought this could be really, really... <laughs> you see, Peter, when a bull and a cow really love each other... <laughs> it's, it's been a, a real pleasure to, uh, to, to have you here. I know in a separate session uh, altogether you're going to be signing autographs, yeah. and uh, that's... Excellent. Um, and so thank you for doing that because, you know what, uh, although cons are amazing, not everybody signs autographs, so I'm really glad that you're doing that. And I just want to say this. That's cool. Baba Booey! <laughs> <laughs> He's the Howard fan. <laughs> and, uh, for serious, uh, there you go, you're in New York City. Yes, now, I know these people didn't get to ask questions, but catch up with me at some point over the next couple of days. If, they, if you really want to know the answer to these questions, I'll answer them. Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Davis.